Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet. Sadly wrapped still in a pandemic and with all kinds of political uncertainty in many parts of the world and division and polarization and the information environment we all live in, mostly online is very contaminated and distracting and confusing place sometimes. Today on this Earth Institute Sustain What webcast, the focus is the future of energy in the context of climate change, subject I've been reporting on since 1988. I'm Andy Revkin. I've been running the uh, new initiative on communication and sustainability here at Columbia. And a couple of colleagues have uh, recently uh, taken a new stab, several colleagues with some partners have taken a new stab at laying out an architecture, a, a detailed roadmap for re-energizing uh, America in a way that fits us into the climate landscape without continuing to dis distort the climate system. I have some great guests coming in who are um, in the green room, in the video <laughs> green room. There's no M&Ms and, and orange juice there. You have to have your own nutrition. Uh, and the, the idea is in the next hour to really kind of cut forward and see, you know, how do we move from roadmaps to reality? How do, how do we take get traction on an issue that, you know, again, as a reporter, I'm kind of a curmudgeon because I've been writing stories about this literally, uh, well, half of my life. And I don't see much evidence that my storytelling has made a difference. And I'd like to think that this new report uh, might make a difference. So um, let me just uh, do one thing here. And I want to introduce uh, two of the co-authors. Uh, there's a, several, and it's really a book length a report you can find online, just uh, Google for, well, you will find out more about that in a second, Google for Energizing America and Columbia University. Uh, and here's uh, Varun Sivaram and Julio Friedman, both of whom are senior research scholars at Columbia's um, Center on Global Energy Policy. And Varun, I got to know through his uh, work when he was at Council on Foreign Relations and Energy Policy and Technology and Innovation. He's written a great book about solar power. You can find those uh, the background on some of this stuff at the home page of this uh, this uh, website. Varun, it's good to see you. Great to see you, Andy. Can you hear and me? Okay. Yes, and you're back in this. You were you and your wife were in different parts of the world for a while. I know Lakshmi too. So you are you in uh, back in the states? I I am back in the states. I uh, got back right as the as the pandemic hit, and I'm in D.C. now. It's great to see you. And and Lakshmi is a big fan of yours. It's mutual. It's a mutual admiration society. What she's doing with global press is uh, fantastic, cutting edge stuff, just like what you do with energy policy and, and technology. Uh, you'll learn more about Varun's uh, background in a minute. And Julio Friedman, you're in the Livermore, California area. Indeed, I am. Greetings and salutations to you and to your guests. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, um, at Carbon Wrangler, Julio Friedman has also been on this program on our Sunday shows, they're focused on music. He's a fine pianist and has contributed Aaron Copeland and Brahms, and it's just been wonderful to have him, that side of him. But today we're gonna to talk, this is a serious talk about uh, our energy future and, and energy inertia as well, unfortunately, uh, is a, still a sad part of our reality. Uh, just to lay out a context here, I'm pulling up a slide. This is last year's, um, EIA, that's the US Energy Administration, Energy Information Administration uh, documents showing projections. And of course, they're all wrong. All energy projections are wrong. But some of these long term ones have been pretty robust in terms of decarbonization. And here you can see basically we're still heading toward a world that's still largely fossil, fossilized, even decades to come. And that's like, this has been this challenge the world has faced over and over again. So tell us a little bit about the report. And if you, uh, Varun, I don't know if you're set up to show slides, the ones that we try to get, uh, I can show us the Adobe document, but if you have your slides, you might be able to show that'd be great. And then we can talk through them. All right, let me try that. Um, um, you should see a share function and then a window pops up that then I can share. And I see it So coming. can you guys see something? It's coming right there. There we there go, we go, yes. All right, fantastic. Um, well, well, why don't we do this? Um, Andy, uh, Julio and I and, and David Sandlo, our Columbia co-author, David Hart and Colin Cunliffe, our ITIF co-authors, have hours of slides to delight you with. Uh, but we can do, you know, we can do the five-minute version, the 10-minute version. Yeah, What's your five. preference? The five, five okay. and then we'll uh, open up some of the other folks who are going to come on and 
dig in a little more. Sounds great. So, uh, and, and would you like me to go for five or hand it over to Julio for, for us to tag team in? Well, you start in and when we get to the, you know, carbon withdrawal parts or that the like, Julio can Perfect. Weigh in. Perfect. All right. So um, we wrote Energizing America to give the next administration and Congress a very detailed roadmap uh, over the next five years to triple clean energy funding for innovation to $25 billion by 2025. We wanted to make it really actionable. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what motivated us. You know, before previous administrations, we had seen uh, similarly authoritative roadmaps, you know, rising above the gathering storm in 2007, uh, led to the founding and uh, funding of ARPA-E. And so ahead of this potential next transition, and frankly, uh, no matter what Congress looks like, we think that there's bipartisan support to support this. And we've seen that, you know, there's there, there's been high level support from every Democratic presidential candidate and both sides of Congress. You know, uh, Lamar Alexander, Republican from Tennessee, called for a Manhattan Project for Clean Energy Innovation to double funding. The problem, however, is that the overall vision and the details aren't there. Uh, there may be a high level funding target, but what we really needed was down to line item recommendations for how to fund all of this, along with a forest and trees perspective to make sure that we were funding the right things and, and giving taxpayers a high return on their investment. So we've, we, we bifurcated uh, the volume into two parts. The first part of the book is uh, a, a uh, the, the, the case for why we need uh, more funding. And in fact, uh, and I'll hand it over to Julio in a moment, in fact, why we need $25 billion by 2025. And the second half is the roadmap itself. It's you know strategic and tactical guidance to the next administration in Congress. It's 10 technology pillars, including some of the technologies that Julio is uh, you know expert at and works on a lot, like carbon removal and carbon dioxide uh, capture six strategic principles to help the federal government make sure that we spend our money most effectively, and three immediate actions, the first 100-day plan so that they hit the ground running. So with that, let me hand it over to Julio um, to just give us the, the motivation, and then we can pause before the roadmap and hand it back to you, Andy. Sure. Sure. I, I will do this super, super fast. And uh, just, uh, Varun, since you've, you're driving here, I'll just ask for the next slide, please. Um, the first thing that we, there's basically two good reasons to do this. One of the good reasons is climate. We're just not anywhere on track. We are not moving fast enough. We're not doing big enough. And we looked and said, given the existing budget, the innovation we're going to get is maybe a quarter of what the U S needs. And if we double the budget, it'll only be 40%, maybe a third of what we need. Like we just need a whole lot more investment and innovation to drive things. We're just not on track from a climate perspective. Investing from a climate perspective reduces the cost and speeds the transition. And those are very robust findings for the scholars who've studied such things. Putting money into innovation gets you speed and gets you cost reduction. So that's good. There's another reason to do it too. Next slide, please, which is competitiveness. Uh, we are in a world in which clean energy products are increasingly valued, where emissions reduction is increasingly valued. And frankly, the United States has not got its game face on. Uh, compared to other countries, we are investing a much smaller part of our GDP. Today, uh, about 0.03% of our GDP less is going into clean energy research. Compare that to China, they're basically putting in twice their GDP that we are, but even countries like Estonia and Hungary are putting more of their GDP into investment than we are. And that's because they see a competitive edge in a carbon constrained world. And so if America wants to be able to make products and sell products for the future, we just got to put more into innovation. Next by slide. Way, by the Go way, can we, can we talk briefly about definitions? Because when we talk R&D and D and D and innovation, there's lots of different de definitions. I'm sure they're in the report, but... Basic mm -hmm. research is, you know, the chemistry that comes up with mm -hmm. a super new idea that can end up being a battery that can end up in a product. That's the innovation. So, so are we talking? How much of this is basic R and D versus um, innovation pipeline stimulus? So, uh, I'm going to let Varun deal with that in his bit because we've got a detailed breakout of that, and the explanations is why we need to feed the entire pipeline. 
Uh, but this plan goes all the way from basic research through development, through demonstration. So, and the demonstration piece is very important. And again, Varun will talk about that. Um, why don't we just skip this slide in the interest of time? It's better to have more questions. Sure. Um, one of the things that we did to try to figure this out is what's a reasonable amount? Like, should we double, should we triple, should we quadruple? Right. More is not exactly a detailed roadmap. And we basically looked at this and said prior national challenges had a commensurate investment. And just as one example, the recent health issues, like we've got basically 0.2% of GDP, which is you know five times more than what we're doing right now on energy RD and D. So that's a big challenge that looks like a big commitment. And so we also wanted to make sure though that the money was well spent. We also have research in the report that shows that if you put too much money in the wrong way, you don't get a good outcome, you just waste money. So we ended up on a tripling as basically a way to say, that looks like we could spend that amount of money carefully and well on important stuff. And uh, those dollars would yield dividends. But if we spent more than that, maybe not. And if we spent less than that, we'd fail at the mission. With that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Varun to take over the second part of the report. Oh, Varun, you're uh, muted. Thanks. Uh, I'll just quickly say that in order to make this happen, uh, we created what we think is the most comprehensive database of uh, U.S. federal government funding for clean energy innovation today, something that the Trump administration has forgotten or intentionally not taken account of. Um, so in the second part of the volume, we talk about the roadmap. And in this roadmap, I'm, I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just going to quickly say um, we have 10 technology pillars, right? And so uh, they include things like foundational research, but they also include things like uh, applications that are critical for decarbonization. This one's familiar to you guys. Clean electricity generation from renewables or nuclear. Um, batteries across these three pillars. Efficiency that touches all the pillars but is concentrated in buildings. And these four that frankly are underappreciated, don't get enough funding. Industrial decarbonization, CCUS, clean agricultural systems, and carbon dioxide removal. Um, I won't go through all the principles, but I'll quickly say that we don't currently uh, spend enough on some of these pillars. And as you can see here, we spend 50% of our funding today on electricity technologies and far less on buildings or agriculture or industry. That needs to change. But And so these six principles answer, for example, your question, Andy, on you want to support all the different stages of the pipeline. Today, the federal government supports mostly basic research. Um, but in the future, we're going to marshal the full capacity of the federal government to support demonstrations, as you can see, to the tune of $5 billion by 2025, um, as well as applied development across those 10 technology pillars, as well as the foundational elements that we talked about, uh, you know, whether it's advanced materials or the use of artificial intelligence. Um, we want to you know, fund uh, national laboratories, universities, and the private sector, and not just any one of these research performers. We want to fund communities across the country to promote equity and to promote a durable political consensus that will last well beyond the next administration. Um, and so that's what the ramp looks like. Between now and 2025, $25 billion of clean energy innovation funding that could sustain a million long-term jobs. 100-day plan? Yep, go ahead. Well, maybe let's, let's pause now and uh, we can get back into the slides for maybe in a minute. I want to bring in a couple more people. Um, and the other thing I have to bring in is some questions related to, um, well, Costa Samaras at Carnegie Mellon. I think his colleague, Paulina uh, Jaramillo is going to come on in a second. He used to say to me that uh, uh, budget is policy, meaning it, what you haven't yet done is compare this to, well, you did a little bit, but uh, the uh, military R&D, basic science budget for military is still around $80 billion a year. Medical has gotten up to medicine, you know, basic science is 40 billion a year. This has been at, depending on who you talk to, historically R&D for um, energy, including all energy, including extracting fossil fuels, it's like four or 5 billion a year. There was that one blip during the oil crisis. So, so 25 billion starts to feel, makes it start to feel like this is actually remotely a priority in America compared to the other things that we claim to prioritize. Is that is that a fair way to gauge it? 
So the oh, other yeah. You're wa waving your finger. Absolutely. That's a fair way to gauge it. Um, and the other thing that I want to be clear about is $25 billion is just the opening ante. That's the first tranche. We know that we can spend that money well in that time frame, but over the next five years, we may discover that we need to invest more, in which case, great, we'll invest more or at least talk about investing more. But we, we have this enormous challenge and this enormous opportunity, and we're simply underinvested for the, for the mission. And also, for just for a comparison, can you describe a little bit how this compares to the Obama stimulus coming out of the recession? There was a big chunk of money that was proposed then, and my reading of it was it was this little blip that then ended pretty much. Uh, even it was not what you would ever see as actually transformative new timeline. Kind of as Julio was saying, you need this doesn't it can't be cast as a one time thing, right? Yes. Um, so, so, so I'm just pulling up the exact number in a, in a moment, but to, to give you a sense of magnitude, um, the United States' is spending on clean energy innovation as a percentage of GDP has not actually risen uh, to beat its peak in the 1970s. So what we're proposing here, as Julio mentioned, which kind of puts us in the same order of magnitude as some other priorities, such as health innovation, uh, is really a departure from the past, the blip notwithstanding. Uh, now, now, the, the uh, Recovery Act investment, you know, was in fact uh, a, a substantial investment. Um, but look, it, it was on the order of uh, um, uh, point, point 0.08% of GDP. Um, and, and what we're hoping to get to is to, uh, is to bring clean energy investment funding up to 0.1% of GDP and put it on that same kind of order of magnitude. And it shouldn't just be a one-year, one-shot wonder, right? As Julio right. said, the important thing here is to sustain that funding for many years going forward. This should be the new floor. And that's that, that's what's happened in the health uh, arena. In health, you know, year after year, the new standard baseline is uh, a, a, a level of investment that encourages the academic sector, the private sector uh, to flourish. And that baseline scale is what we're looking for here in energy as well. And but you don't he, have to create a culture. People have to want to go into the field, right? Meaning young scholars like we'll meet in a minute. Oh, yeah. If they're going to devote their lives to, to a field and you think it's just some blippy thing as opposed to a, a new priority for the, for the long haul. That actually that. happened in 2009, 2010. A whole bunch of people entered, entered clean energy. And then when the money went away, they left. Like right. that was a, a terrible legacy. And or groups and projects like Cyclotron Road were built to help fix some of that. Right. Um, we were blessed in this report work to have a colleague like David Sandala, who actually worked two transitions, <laughs> right, and who wasn't there during the Obama stimulus. And right, so let me go ahead. I'm going to bring in uh, a couple of our special guests uh, with two more to come. Uh, Indra Overland and uh, Jeffrey Risman will be on in a couple of minutes too. But here, uh, speaking of the next generation, is Zdenka Mislikova, who's from the Fletcher School at uh, Tufts University, working with a, a, a good friend of, I think, several of us, Kim uh, uh, Gallagher, um, Kelly Gallagher, sorry, and um, and Paula Jaramillo. Jaramillo. Is it Jaramillo or Jar Jaramillo? I should, I want to make sure uh, I'm right. It's Jaramillo. Jaramillo. So I got it wrong three times, two times. <laughs> <laughs> at Carnegie Mellon, uh, who, who I've intersected with many times journalistically. Uh, it's great to have you here as well. Um, so be before we get more from Julio and, and Var Varun, uh, Varun, it would be great to have your initial thoughts, both of you, on. And to me as a journalist, I'm always saying, so what's different this time? It's, and, and maybe Zdenka, again, representing that cohort of young people getting into this field. Uh, what's your thinking right now? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Andy, and thank you all. I looked at the report, I looked at the piece, a really great piece and great timing to bring it up. And in one of the steps, in one of the three concrete steps you have there, you, have, you are touching upon the role of the US in mission innovation, which leads us to the global context and how the global context is for an ambitious plan, right? And I, I would think there couldn't be a better time to be ambitious. And not only pragmatically, because we really need to be ambitious. Ambitions, but I think on the global level, we have really built the momentum uh, to be ambitious in energy innovation and to 
to make the best out of it locally and globally. You know, and uh, I like to think about energy innovation as a team sport on international level. And uh, if we want to be really, um, if we want to achieve technological break, uh, cost reductions quickly. And the US, of course, obviously has very important. Well, that's, yeah, I was going to ask about that because a lot of your work is focused on that knowledge transfer or the dynamics internationally. And, and Julio mentioned as well, you showed that table of what other countries are doing on, on their relative contribution of their funding toward their R&D. So how, how much does the U.S. matter? You know, we think of China and other countries as pushing forward. We're, and we're, what are we doing in nuclear right now, for example? I'm sure we'll get some input from Julio and, and Varun on that too. But how much does the U.S. matter in, in the work you're doing? So much, of course, like every member in that mission, among mission innovation countries matters. And the U.S. has been, you know, the country with the largest innovation system and the largest R&D budget, RD&D budget over time, historically. And even if it hasn't it actually withdrew from its commitment to double the, the, uh, the budget between 2015 and 2020, it still matters very much because uh, this mission innovation group is actually a really interesting group of um, countries that both like there is this fellowship, very interesting fellowship, and there is also this competition. And so um, it will be very interesting to see if the U.S. increases its budget, how it will actually stimulate the countries to increase it, you know, to take on the role and to stimulate them. Because currently, for example, when we look on the submissions of the member countries of Mission Innovation Secretariat, we see that China is really uh, catching up with the U.S. and other countries that uh, traditionally haven't ha don't have um, innovation ecosystems that well developed or don't focus on them, they were able to double their clean energy RD in the extent. You know, there is the momentum, there is the eagerness, and the U.S. definitely has its role to push it further, to be more ambitious and to take it the rest of the country further. And and you you have this paper I just put up on the screen with uh, Kelly also um, that just came out in September I think um, uh, on this idea of mission innovation and just uh, maybe we could just briefly describe what that is I wrote about this a couple of years ago Moniz and others were meeting in San Francisco I think mm -hmm. it was yeah. this project so it's mission innovation is this initiative that came out of the Paris Agreement five years ago in 2015, um, knowing that if we want to honor the Paris Agreement and achieve the pledges, innovation is indispensable. And so 24 countries nowadays, it was 23 countries, and the European Union committed to significantly um, increase their clean energy D&D expenditures. Actually, they committed to double them and to collaborate among the different countries to spur innovation and accelerate uh, the cost reductions. So uh, Paulina, uh, I'd love to get your context on this too. Um, you're running several very relevant projects at Carnegie Mellon. And when you think about where we are, and my question about, is this time different? You, you know, What can uh, we do now that maybe we couldn't have done in the Obama period or uh, what, what comes to mind? So I think the time for urgent action was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, what's different, and I think what's different right now is that we're three weeks away from an election that will be very um, uh, consequential in this area, right? We have two very different candidates with very different perceptions about climate and we can't think of about climate without thinking about energy. So I think that's where, that's why this is very important now. And depending on who wins, maybe nothing will be different. Will the US will remain in, in this stage of not really changing um, or pursuing really ambitious climate goals linked to research and innovation in energy. But it, on the other hand, the other candidate could really mean a drastic change in policy associated with these issues. And the plan um, that Julio and Varun put together can serve as a, as a roadmap for that. 
So I don't know that we will actually see anything come out of these until we get the results from the election. For sure. Yeah, talk well, about a turning in the road. Yeah. If I could speak to that just a little yeah, bit yeah. and turn to Varun as well. Um, certainly the election matters here, but uh, the, one of the things we want to leave you with is the broad, strong, persistent, consistent, bipartisan, bicameral support for energy innovation. Over the past six years, we've seen a doubling of these budgets from where they were to where they are now. Uh, it's been a substantial increase, not quite a doubling. I'm, I take that back. It's but but uh, year on year increases every year. So we think that uh, regardless of the outcome of the presidential election, there's room to build. Uh, Varun, you want to add to that? Yeah. Look, I'll, I'll, I completely agree with Julio. In, in Congress, there is broad bipartisan bicameral support. Um, I do think that there will be a critical role to play for orchestration or execution of this you know, fairly sophisticated national energy innovation mission. This is not as easy as throw money at the problem. And although we hope that uh, uh, you know Congress will will adapt our roadmap, which which gives line item recommendations at the appropriations control points, we also think there's an important role for the next administration to play. Uh, and making sure that the, the trains run on time and, and making sure that different agencies are coordinated in their complementary efforts across the federal government, not just uh, the DOE, but also the DOD, NASA, NSF, et cetera, right. uh, to invest in clean energy innovation. And that will probably take uh, for it to be most effective. I'm going to come out and say it. It's going to take a Biden administration. Yeah. I, and I just want to share a map that this is from several years ago, but the, the uh, findings are no different now. Um, I wrote a piece for the Times, no red and blue divide when it comes to renewable energy innovation and CO2 rules. This was the map from Yale of uh, Yale and partners of the 50 states support of clean energy uh, of here, renewable energy source research. And it's complete. Yes, it's a big yes. It's enthusiastic. Yes. And you compare that to at the time. And I, I would swear I, I know that these aren't that different now. The worries about global warming have gotten more significant. That's changed. But you can see the map, the the focus, the intensity of it, whatever you were feeling about global warming back at least in those days was like muted colors. When you look at support for clean energy innovation, it's all strong yes. And I think that's why this resonates for me. What you're talking about, your project feels like it can hit some buttons that... Um, are, are missed otherwise. Uh, before we go on, I want to bring in uh, Jeff Grisman and Indra Overland. And we, it's getting a little crowded in here, so I'm going to shift to this this uh, matrix. And I'm really happy to have a social scientist. Well, actually, Paulina, what's your background? What, what, your, before um, I say, you know, no, there's no, been a technological I'm, focus so far, but I, I'm an engineer. I, I'm in a, an interdisciplinary department at Carnegie Mellon, uh, yeah. the engineering and public policy, but my training is as an engineer. I do work with a lot of social scientists. So, so I'm bringing in Indra Overland from Norway who runs, uh, actually, to save me time opening up my file, you could just explain w the re where you're teaching and, and working, and, and Jeffrey Ritzman at Energy Innovation. So Indra, great to have you here, and I'm going to show your work in a second. Thank you very much. Could you just uh, say where you're yeah. working? So I, I work, I run the uh, Center for Energy Research at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. So I'm, an, I'm a social scientist, very, feel very privileged to be invited. And uh, I work on international energy and climate issues. Well, the reason I brought you into our little lunch gathering here is um, your work has put numbers onto something that I've been reporting on a little bit for years, which is when you think about pathways to rapid decarbonization in a world where energy is a vital underpinning of life, where a lot of the economy is still embedded with fossil norms from commuting to heating, cooling. I, I live in a 150 year old house with heating oil because we have no gas, let alone efficient electricity. And so behavior and societal behavior are key questions. And yet your work finds that when you look at across uh, investments and in research, it's 0.12% of investment in climate energy related research goes into the social sciences. Now that's because you don't have to build big supercomputers and stuff maybe, but that's still, even you take that away. So let's say it's 5% or 3%. 
it feels to me like a complete imbalance between where we invest and we think about innovation. It means social, cultural, political policy innovation as much as like a better battery, or at least is, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, that is very much our message. So I think while we, uh, this is Benjamin Sovacool, my co-author and, and myself, while we would agree uh, with all of you about, you know, we have very much a similar perspective. We also, there's a certain point where we take a, a different line um, and we see that uh, in, in technological research and the natural science, or if we take natural sciences first in terms of understanding climate change, there are many things we don't know. There are many things that are not known about how it plays out, but a lot of the basics are quite well established and well recognized. And the same goes for the technological solutions. Um, when it comes to uh, if you look at uh, solar power, wind power, uh, energy storage, uh, there has been uh, quite a lot of progress in those areas and the costs have been plummeting and are continuing to plummet. So seen from our perspective, uh, things look pretty promising in that area. The, the, the real challenge, the, the intractable challenge that we haven't solved yet is how to get people to use uh, all of those technological solutions. And that's about changing politics, changing human behavior, changing culture, changing institutions. So that's pol political science, economics, uh, law, sociology, and so on. And, and the way we see it, those are, the, those are actually now, uh, whether one likes it or not, those are the main, uh, the main puzzles, the main remaining barriers to mitigating climate change. And, and those are the areas uh, research into those areas that only get 0.12% of the research funding between 1990 and 2019, based on an analysis of $1.3 trillion of funding. So we've right. we've uh, managed to cover quite a lot of funding. So, uh, uh, sorry. I just, I, I think I'm going to disagree a little bit with something here. We have done really a lot of good work on research and development for power generation. Um, I don't think the technological solutions for decarbonizing non-power sector are there. I mean, if we look at, I'm involved in the IPCC six assessment report actually with, with um, Benjamin, I think industry and transportation are still um, a big challenge. And even within the power sector, right? Like we look at the report, the 1.5 Celsius deg uh, degree report from the IPCC, and they're relying heavily on negative emissions, even in power generation, right? BEX, those are not technologies that are fully commercially developed. Mm -hmm, that's for sure. Uh, of course, of course, there's a lot of research that remains to be done and that is being done, but a lot of this is already driven by markets, uh, by companies uh, trying to position themselves to, to do business in these areas. And, and there is already a, a quite a clear uh, track record of progression in this area. And as I said, the prices have been falling a lot. So a lot of pieces are still missing, but you, you still have the, the development. Mm -hmm. uh, on the political side, even if uh, your current president loses this election, he may have 40% of your population voting for him, or of your voters at least, voting yeah. for him. That's, that's a problem. That's, and it, there doesn't seem to be a solution. And there are many problems like that. I, I mean, of other, other places and other social loops. So I want to introduce Jeff too. And, and by the way, does anyone here have to cut off in a hard way at two o'clock? I mean, at, at, at the hour. All right. So so let let me try to make sure you both get some time before then, because I'm hoping we can go a little longer. Because this, or we'll have to just do a follow up. Th these are not one. Just like this is not a one pulse of money problem. It's also not a one conversation problem. And I want to make sure we dig in uh, appropriately. But uh, Jeff Risman at Energy uh, Innovation, uh, run by Hal Harvey, who's been a, one of my kind of go-to people in the Bay Area forever on these issues, is uh, look, he, you do like energy model, you're doing policy model comparison. You're looking at different you know, guides and pathways and trying to assess them um, in that landscape. So when you see this new uh, approach, um, what comes to mind is filling gaps or, you know, where do we go from here in terms of what your priorities there are at energy innovation? Thanks, Andy. 
Um, so I think this Energizing America report is extremely important and has a valuable message and a valuable approach to um, helping policymakers figure out how to get from where we are now to where we need to be. So um, it's absolutely true that we need to greatly increase our support for energy innovation. And um, so that's not controversial, as you pointed out, with your uh, heat maps of various uh, support across the country for, for that approach. Um, and there's also sometimes a question of why government has to be involved here. And, that, um, and that's something I've looked at in the past. For instance, at one project, I was interviewing chief technology officers and chief scientists at various innovation-focused companies, many but not all in the energy space. And they all talked about how government leadership here is important for them. And they, one example was uh, cooperative research and development agreements or CRADAs with national labs. One major engine manufacturer, for example, explained that it's hard, he's, this is the CTO, and it's hard for the CTO to justify the idea of building an entire combustion research facility and hiring dedicated staff to analyze combustion to tweak their engines to be more fuel efficient. But the national labs already have such a facility already built and already staffed with top-notch scientists. So he can make the argument to the C CEO to do this partnership with the lab and get the research data they need to improve their the efficiency of their engines. And the same is true, that's not just for engines, the same is true for all kinds of technologies where partnerships with the government can help make it far more affordable and more and faster for the companies to uh, develop the types of batteries, electric vehicles, um, and so on. And then in one step of technological maturity earlier than that, so a little less mature, would be things like uh, the technologies to decarbonize industry. So hydrogen use and hyd cheaper hydrogen production through electrolysis rather than steam reforming methane into hydrogen. And that's another area where government support is very valuable because um, at the moment, it's uh, we still need to build the market for things like clean hydrogen, where it has to compete at the moment with methane derived hydrogen in a, and with no national carbon price. So innovation support can help bring down those costs and then um, that can spur the creation of new industries and new jobs. So I guess uh, just giving some concrete examples, not just why innovation is important, but why government help and in involvement is also key. Well, that kind of gets at uh, Indra's point that that sort of social, so societal and holistic dynamic, you know, understanding it as, uh, and this report does this, as Varun and Julia were saying, being strategic right. about where that money gets spent so is important. It, but let me just, first of all, because you, Jeff mentioned it, I have to give a shout out to my homies at Sandia National Laboratory, which is about a mile and a half from my house that has this world-class combustion facility. And he's right, those things exist all over the country. They're in every region of the country, there's something that looks like that that can help industry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Varun to talk about both crowding and private investment and also diversifying the funding across different groups because that's a part of our report. Similarly, a lot of the points that uh, Jeffrey and Paulina have made are reflected in the line items that we've laid out and the budgets behind them to put more money into those things that have been traditionally underinvested, and so uh, I'm going, Varun. Would you just take it from here and talk about those points? Yeah, and then put Paulina has a point to make. Yep. Indra, okay. Yeah, so you'll be super quick. First, on Indra's point, uh, I just want to say, Energizing America is not an exhaustive roadmap for all the federal government should spend on climate and energy. It's actually a tiny, tiny fraction. Twenty-five billion dollars is like you know a percent of the two trillion dollar plan that you guys have been hearing about. So. Um, let, let's just be clear, th this is the highest leverage way you can spend funding on energy innovation, but it's certainly not the only way you should spend funding. And I also want to make the point that Julio and I feel strongly uh, that energy innovation, energy R, D, and D is complementary with other policies. Policies, you know, for example, that are demand pull policies to support technologies, carbon pricing, electricity standards, et cetera, to pull technologies onto the market. 
to, to Julio's first uh, point here, um, th there's a wealth of research that demonstrates that federal funding for clean energy innovation, public funds, crowd in private funds. And that the crowding out effect that some have worried about is not only false, it's actually the opposite of what happens. And really the only crowding out effect that happens is probably one that we want to encourage, which is uh, a, a cool research paper shows that uh, the more the a government spends on clean energy innovation, the more private dollars flow out of conventional energy innovation and toward clean energy innovation. That's an effect that I think we ought to encourage. Um, so, so, so let me, uh, I know Paulina and Indra had, had two fingers, so, so I'll cede uh, over to them. But yeah, and we can circle back. And as I said, this is chapter one, so we don't have to fit everything in. Paulina, what were you thinking? Yeah, so I I really enjoyed the report and um, the different the pillars that were identified. I noticed that I'm a system modeler, so I need to talk about system um, analysis uh, because I think like we see a lot of these. Like obviously, we need the there's a complementary there. We need to have um, the technology, but we also need to figure out how they integrate into the system and how they interact with other systems, and that includes social system. So I think a really interesting um, idea is we have all of these technical economic models that are looking at least cost optimization of the system. And it's very difficult to account for social constraints, but there should be research on which of those pathways are just not feasible because of social constraints. And those can be governance, policy, or even just perception. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just bring up is obviously this is focused on energy policy, like energy innovation in the US, but climate is a global problem. Um, and yes, China is a big problem and Europe is a big problem. I'm really concerned about the global south and how emissions in the global south are low now, but could be, could overwhelm and like surpass. Um, global north emissions if we don't do anything, particularly in Africa, where we're expected to have 2.5 billion people by 2050. Uh, and so I think also, and this idea that we can have the technologies and just send them there and they will be deployed, I think it's flawed. Um, and so I think also research on technology transfer from the US or from Europe to other, or from China to other countries and technology transfer that is actually I, let's call it sustainable, that is not, we'll just give you all these technologies and figure it out, or not just technical support for governments, but actually really understanding what would work, I think also needs to be part of the research portfolio. And that's what Zdenko was getting at that a few minutes ago. And I just was looking at the IEA World Energy Outlook for 2020 this morning, and just what you were describing, both in terms of energy needs and energy options in developing countries is a, a serious problem. In fact, they've seen the IEA just today, yesterday, showed that with the pandemic impact that solar act, energy access in, in Africa has, has gone down this past year already. There's a, it's a very sensitive system. And it isn't yeah. just basic access, right? It is also- Oh yeah, we're talking about, right, no electricity. Well, it isn't just that, right? It's also, for transportation, for industry, right? I mean, think about right. transportation of goods and services in the continent of Africa. Um, and if consumption levels increase, the amount of energy we're going to need to transport goods. Yeah. Uh, so, Zdenka, did you want to briefly weigh in on that? And then, uh, Indra, I know you've been waiting to. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I actually believe that what we have seen in the past years, at least five years, I would say more, at least 15, that uh, there has been more focus on uh, the developing country needs, you know, and so um, they are increasingly shaping the global energy innovation ecosystems. And we have done research in, in my lab on exactly the energy innovation ecosystems in the global south, if you say so, or several countries there. And those countries have been um, investing uh, their, um, their resources. And thanks to mission innovation, those countries are now collaborating with the countries that have developed these ecosystems. So there is much more information flow, I would say. And I also think it's important to focus on how the innovation systems in these developing countries need to you know, 
uh, tweak their own policies to even create our D and D um, ecosystem itself, more than just bringing their the innovation, the, the technological innovation, but how they can be creating it locally, and we really don't know right now. But there has been more focus, definitely, and I believe there will still be more thanks to mission. That gets to Indra's work, Indra's work too, and I, I I spent time in India a couple of years ago, <laughs> rural India, looking at uh, the energy ecosystem, especially around cooking, and uh, talked to people all around the world about the challenges there. And in a way, the innovation pipeline, if it's not reaching to that scale, like some people like Harish Honda, who is a run Selco in India, I don't know, Varun, or do you know him, has been really trying to innovate at that level. Like, how do we have a, a way to go into a village and get at least adequate energy for cooking and, and work and the like? Um, I talked to Bill Gates about this in 2016, the video interview I did with him, and he wasn't even thinking about that. When he thinks innovation, it's about big, you know, grid, uh, zero carbon systems, nuclear and the like. Um, so I, I, this, I, this is why I, I, some part of me really sides with Indra here that that, and actually what, what Paulina was saying too, that that, if you're not looking at all those dimensions of the world's energy gaps with equal vigor right now, then you have these populations who are still cooking on biomass in 2050 like Sub-Saharan Africa, they're, they've projected it's still, I think it's a ridiculous number of households will still be cooking on, on, on wood in 2050 because of poverty and population growth and lack of options. So it just feels like that's part of the mix too. I, I, I love the report. Yeah, I, 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 for the US, it's a fantastic roadmap. And, and I'm going to use the word and instead of but. We need equal vigor and, and focus on these other aspects of the, the energy challenge and the changing climate. I'll, I'll just quickly say on that, Andy, um, you know, that there was a great, um, Rose Mutisu from Energy for Growth had a great TED talk about um, Africa's upcoming development, Sub-Saharan Africa's upcoming development challenges and how climate factors in. And it's just really important for us to remember that like, uh, what many of these countries in sub-Saharan Africa do in terms of their energy development will be immaterial to climate change, and we shouldn't be constraining their choices in right. any way. And frankly, yeah, Andy, as you said, you know, it's 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 in the mix. Um, energy access and development challenges are in the mix, but they are distinct and often separable from the actions we take to reduce emissions. Really, the actions we take to reduce emissions, like the top ten emitters, are far more important. Uh, right then, sorry, go, go ahead, Paul. I completely disagree with that statement. I think focusing on basic energy access, so providing electricity for a couple of light bulbs and for a TV, that's not going to be a significant. No, no, I'm, I, I'm with you we, on that. Like, if we, if Africa gets to a level of, of their carbon intent, like the carbon intensity of their energy system to a level of Latin America, which is much smaller than ours, even that their emissions are going to surpass the U.S.'s. So I am totally with you on that. But it is still the case, Paulina, that uh, if you focus on certain countries in sub-Saharan Africa as potential climate challenges and other countries in sub-Saharan Africa as not potential climate challenges, and you still aim for a high threshold of modern energy access for all of these countries, uh, you still should be differentiating where your climate challenge is from where your access challenge is. And sometimes they will be the same country and sometimes they won't. Yeah, but so th I'm, these aren't co-linear. Right. I'm, not so I'm not worried about, again, basic access. I am worried about transportation and I'm worried about industry and I'm worried about agriculture. Um, and those are can be significant, right? They are not immaterial to the climate discussion. So to try to pull this thread back to energy innovation, uh, uh, and then to, to I'll be very brief to go to Indra. First and foremost, uh, if you haven't seen Varun's TED Talk, you should. He gave a killer TED Talk this Saturday. You, the link's on our website. I encourage you to do it. But he talks about this associated with energy growth in India uh, and, and what can be done. Um, <laughs> the... In 2040, India is going to be the most populous nation. The solutions they need there are stuff like clean cooking and really efficient air conditioning systems. That's not necessarily a top 10 in the United States, but boy, if we were working on energy innovation to that problem, we could sell a bunch of air conditioners. That'd be great for the country and the climate. 
The number two most populous nation will be China. The number three most populous nation will be Nigeria. Right. In 2040, there will be 400 million people Heading in Nigeria. Heading to 750 million. And we are not exactly working on in innovations to serve that market. So that's a disadvantage to the country. It's a disadvantage to the populace. It's a disadvantage to the climate. And it's a disadvantage to commerce. Part of that should be numerate. We should be thinking about tons. But part of that should also be culturally sensitive, really understanding how those systems work, how people make decisions in there. And that's a tie back to social science research, which would help that decision making. Well, and just just to kind of make the point even more, I think it's important to look at this energizing, re-energizing America template as a very specific and discrete part of the challenge. And so I actually, I know Indra has been waiting for forever, and I actually have a question for him. We don't know what demand for energy services will look like in these countries. Right? We have no idea. The utilities in sub-Saharan Africa are struggling because everyone thought build the, the electricity infrastructure and demand will follow, and that's not happening. So we don't even know how demand could turn out, le even less about transportation. And I think that's where the social science really has to be part. And that's not necessarily innovation, but it's research. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that's definitely research, social science research. And I think uh, both you, Pauline, and Julio had a very important point there about rolling out technology, but that requires understanding the context it's going into and adapting and preparing people for it. Um, and that's kind of at the at the back end of technological development. But you can also turn you can also look at the other end. And uh, we were discussing earlier a little bit the prioritization between uh, funding for technology research and social science research. And in a sense, the social science research is the basis for the technological research, so for the funding for the technological research, because the, the, the decision to grant funding to technological research grows out of a context, a social context. And that social context are different strategies and institutions and ways of forming that context, which can help lead to prioritization. So for example, if we, if we didn't have the Paris Agreement, the funding for uh, clean energy technology would probably be looking different. If we had something better than, I mean, lower, if we had something better than the Paris Agreement, uh, the funding might be higher because more countries uh, and more companies would be taking this seriously and investing in it, uh, positioning themselves for the future. Um, and one of the problems now is that the Paris Agreement doesn't really give a lot of developing countries incentives uh, mm -hmm. to go in this direction. Many of them haven't really committed too much under the Paris Agreement. I do have an idea. And, Oh, sorry. Uh, and just one more point. So in a sense, everybody's grinding their own axe. We need more funding for research in our field and our friends and so on. Um, fair enough. Um, and of course, of course, there are huge things that need to be done on the technological side, on the natural science side of understanding climate change and, 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 and what causes it in, in detail and how it plays out and so on. Uh, but our point is that we have some really intractable problems where we're really not making progress. And we've made very little progress. And 0.12% of research funding for that just isn't enough. It's, yeah. it's, and, and, and then people say, so how much do you need? You have to calculate the exact number, but there's no way of doing it. But what I can say for sure is 0.12% is not enough for looking into things like, what should the Paris Agreement be like? Um, is there an alternative? Should we have a climate club? Do we need a border adjusted carbon tax? And right. so on. Well, and this gets, Robert Bruhl has been yelling, uh, blowing this trumpet for a decade in my ear. He's, he's a now emeritus uh, sociologist at Drexel. Who, and he, this is a piece I did, I don't know, years ago, two, well, 2016, where the, where the IPCC had a big meeting on communicating climate science, which is all about understanding behavior. And and the thing that was missing was social scientists. It's a bunch of climate scientists who are just kind of scrambling and thinking about how do you communicate better. Um, and he's you know he's been saying that the IPCC composition. You look at the IPCC working group three, where Polina is, has a growing number of social scientists, but it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the IPCC process. And even within the IPCC. There's been this years and years of work to try to get the working groups to talk to each other. 
and that's a social that's a social dynamic that isn't real, well understood. How do you get transdisciplinary work? I I think I have an idea because we're going to run short of time, and I I hate that. Which is if we were to build a re-energizing America mission, meaning an actual something like that, but for this social and uh, holistic. Uh, dynamics that would be necessary to have a global transition away from fossil fuels in time to avoid overheating the climate, we should do that. I mean, it sounds like something to write or at least to, to work on. So anyone here who's interested in all your spare time, let's see who we can pull together to um, to do that. Otherwise, I, you know, I'd hate to think that we're still fighting the same fight, um, you know, a decade from now, because that's way too late in the game. Does that make sense? In other words, this report is fantastic at what it does, which is painting a very uh, concrete kind of picture, a very discrete, concrete, specific picture, how you could invest economically and effectively $25 billion by 2025 instead of a third of that, which is our sleepy norm. And that's been the same under Republican and Democratic administrations. Uh, but it's then I think we should kind of dig in on this dynamic as well and try to do the same thing. If that makes sense, I'm happy to keep that conversation going forward. So Varun, before you leave, if there's some last key points you want to make um, in this very brief hour about the report, that would be awesome to hear from you. Yeah, well, look, very briefly, I just want to emphasize where Paulina and I do agree before we let that thread drop. Sure. We agree that... Uh, uh, much more than basic energy access is needed. In fact, I agree wholeheartedly with what you said, Paulina, about systemic transformations to bring modern uh, energy systems to people all over the world um, and not focus just on uh, two light bulb solutions. Um, I personally think it's still compatible with a, a climate strategy that focuses on the top 10 or 12 emitters. But uh, I, I just want to make clear where you and I agree, which is on the entirely important frame of economic development and energy uh, as the central part of economic development. Um, on, on, on Energizing America, Andy, I'm so grateful that you took the time to convene this illustrious group. I'm grateful for all the compliments. And now Julio and I are just rolling up our sleeves, getting it into uh, members and legislators and administration staffers and, and, and getting it on their bookshelves and trying to get it implemented. So, so we're going to do the, the spade work starting now and we really appreciate the support. Thank you. No, that's great. I'm glad to have had you here. If you have to pop off, pop off. If if you if others can stay for a few more minutes, it would be great to um, have you. Uh, we can talk a little bit more, but we're we'll wrap up pretty quickly. But I would like to give Jeffrey a little more time to articulate, um, you know, what what would be a next step, or if, if you were to partner with Julio and 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 Varun and and Sandalo and the others, what components could you bring? I know you do a lot of the model sort of simulation. Uh, of different outcomes. Uh, that's true. So I can talk about that a bit. Um, we, uh, I'm the lead developer of the Energy Policy Simulator. That's a free and open source computer-based tool that can analyze the impacts of many dozens, uh, 80 plus different types of energy policies. Everything from vehicle fuel economy standards to electric vehicle mandates or subsidies to building, com you know, energy efficient building codes and carbon pricing and on and on there uh, across all sectors. Um, and so that type of tool can then um, tell you what some of the outcomes would be for change in emissions from different pollutants, um, greenhouse gases, as well as particulates and other things. Then you get financial costs and savings to different parts of society like government or different industries. Um, you get uh, public health impacts, the number of human lives saved or avoided premature deaths um, from lower heart pollutant emissions and so on. So if you're trying to make a case, so to connect this to the report and Julio and Varun's work, if you're trying to make this case to policymakers, one powerful way to do it is to model, well, if you, if you accomplish this, if your R&D produced this effect and there are a set of R&D controls in the model, 
what would that look like in terms of the number of jobs or the, the uh, amount of savings on energy? And, and that translates into jobs because when households spend less on energy, they have more money to right. spend on other things, which tend to be more job intensive than, than if they had spent it on industry. So um, I would say that, that that's the key connection. You could model out the sociological, economic, uh, public health, uh, financial implications of, of this and show the many ways in which greater energy invest, R&D investment would benefit society and more than pay for itself. Great. So Paulina, I know you have to leave. It's Thank you again for popping in from Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, and just on a note, the thing is those things that Jeffrey mentioned also require research, which also require funding. <laughs> In other words, as as you're developing the model, you mean? Right. In yeah. making your understanding what the benefits are and the economic impact, all of those things require research also. Uh, but thank you very much for having me. That was a very interesting discussion. More to come. I'm yeah. afraid this is a life a life's work for all of us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Everybody gets a chance to work here. That's the sad part. Um, yeah. to, I, I want to speak. Thank you, Paulina. Bye. Um, yeah. I want to speak briefly to Jeff's point because, in fact, we included a lot of that work in the report. There has been some scholarship, and one of the things that we concluded is this level of investment would increase jobs just in R&D, one million jobs in the U.S., but would have a knock-on effect to seven million jobs economy-wide. And that seems like it's a lot. That would be good. Um, Especially if you can spread it through a lot of congressional districts, Republican and Democrat. Well, and part of the work that we did, again, built on social science and built on economic work, shows that you, you this is uh, first done at the Department of Energy, but since taken up by Ernie Moniz and his team at the Energy Futures Initiative. And they looked at how different regions have different needs and have different solutions that work for their stuff. And so a regional model actually supports regional economic growth, but also tackles the emissions that are most relevant there. So um, I, I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that the work that Jeff said is unimportant, quite the opposite. It's so important. We've already incorporated a bunch of it in the report and recommend that there's more done. Well, again, I think an iterative, iterative approach here is inevitable uh, because even the plasticity of what's going to happen in Congress, uh, we don't know. And that, that'll have, make a huge difference uh, depending on the, uh, the results, uh, how many Republican or Democratic senators there are whether there's an end to the uh, filibuster, <laughs> you know, these things can completely change the socio-political dynamic at any rate. Uh, but the one thing that I think we got to go back to is this consistent support for energy innovation as a priority across all states, red, blue. It's uh, That feels to me something you can then build on. Same thing with uh, resilience. You know, I don't know any liberal or libertarian who wants to live in a brittle society that's going to break the next time it gets hit by a storm or a flood. Uh, and I do know, again, that uh, the first 20 years of my reporting on climate change, you know, from 1988 onward, it took me until 2006 to interview a social scientist. So 18 years of prize-winning journalism, I already done three books by then. And, and that's how long it took me to realize how pivotal understanding human systems and human behavior uh, are to understanding a problem like this. So it was a big mea culpa posted an article in 2016 about that. And, and, and that doesn't, that leads to questions, not answers. You're not going to con people into, into, you know, through some communication trick into decarbonizing. You still need the technological options. And I'm glad you're all working at this. Um, and I hope we can keep at it. Mm -hmm. We do have to kind of wrap up here. I'm going to show a slide, this is the opening slide, and show something about work or what I'm going to be doing on, on um, Friday. So sustain what this is what we did today. Re-energizing, energizing America. We definitely need it. We've been in a slumber party on a bipartisan slumber party on energy innovation for decades. I wrote about this first in the New York Times front page in 2006. Um, Richard Smalley gave an incredible talk on this in 2003, and here we are. So it's it's incredibly great to be working at Columbia where we're building a climate school that's got that transdisciplinary fervor. Uh, and onward we'll go. Um, I, I wanna just sort of show you on Friday, 
a very different topic here on my webcast, Sustain What, is uh, with Erwin, Erwin Redliner, who's a pediatrician who has spent the last several decades focused on the disaster impacts on kids, uh, disasters including the pandemic. And he has a book that's come out at a new edition about this challenge. He says, children are the bellwethers of any society. If they thrive, we do. If they are vulnerable, so is our collective future. And especially if we have an unabated warming of the climate and no sustainable energy choices. So that's where we'll be talking about on Friday. Thank you all again for being here today. Uh, Indra from uh, over in Norway, Jeffrey from the Bay Area, I assume. I never asked you. Uh, so you're, you're, yes, you're, in, you're a neighbor right. of, uh, of Julio. And Zdenka from uh, Boston area, I assume. And uh, those who were here before, thanks for being part of this uh, experiment called Sustain What? And uh, anyone can tune in, you send me feedback or ideas for future episodes looking at that little scrolling bar at the bottom. And be well, stay safe from a distance where needed. And uh, make music on Sundays. Uh, our Sunday shows are always music. And Julio, maybe you'll come back soon. You'll so be pleased you to know I just bought a Yeti Nano to make better Ah, sense. good. The right microphone. So that's, uh, that's it for today. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.